Richard was first captured by horticulture when he was studying a degree in philosophy and social policy at the University of Leeds. His interest was secured during a module on Ebenezer Howard and the Garden City Movement. But Richard credits his Damascene moment as being involved in a student-led community gardening project. On graduation, he volunteered at local gardens, worked for a commercial maintenance company, and also took on self-employed gardening work. In 2015, he undertook a traineeship at Cambridge Botanic Garden. And from there, he started on the Q Diploma. His travel scholarship is to the Northeast USA to look at how botanic gardens are supporting community gardening networks. He was most affected by the cultural boundaries surrounding botanic gardens and how they are working to break these down through community gardening. So please could you help me welcome Richard Choksi. Can everybody hear me? Yep, good. Thank you, Faye, for that introduction. Uh, word of warning, I haven't yet been through this talk in total, so if I overrun, apologies. If I underrun, that's your good fortune. There is a ship in Greek mythology that belongs to the, to, to the hero Theseus. So revered was this hero that his ship was preserved for posterity. Each, as each beam rotted away, it was replaced with another until not a single slat of the original ship remained. All had been replaced, leaving an image of past glory. We have our own ship of, Th of Theseus here at Kew. The temperate house underwent a five-year wet restoration in which every pane of glass, every slat of wood, every beam of metal was meticulously removed, renovated, or replaced, and reconstructed, leaving the dazzling structure that you see before you, a symbol of Victorian industry and splendor. However, what is often left unacknowledged is that this industry and splendor, so often celebrated in popular culture, rests on a foundation of classification, colonization, and subjugation of indigenous lands and people throughout the world. This evening, I would like to take you on a journey to perform at what, at, to perform what be, well, excuse me, <laughs> to perform what will be at times an uncomfortable inquiry into the colonial legacy of botanic gardens. My intention is not to list a litany of shame, but to make what is familiar to people of color that engage with this institution visible to those unaffected by race. I will then present ways in which this legacy has been sublimate, sublimated in botanic gardens in the Northeastern United States. In the interests of full disclosure, through my ancestry on my father's side, I am connected to the origins of European imperialism in Achaemenid Persia. So my relationship with this subject is by no means uncomplicated. There will be time for questions at the end, but I request that they are kept until then. I would like to start with this man, Joseph Banks. He is rightly revered as one of the founding figures in the history of Kew. He used his familiarity with King George III to advocate for dispatching Kew-trained botanists throughout the world to collect plants for the collection and, promote the, and promoted the use of science and botany in the governance of lands both at home and abroad. However, his association with the Imperial Project is not unblemished. Many of you will be familiar with Captain Bly's ill-fated voyage on the Bounty. This voyage was commissioned by Banks to bring breadfruit to the Caribbean. Richard Drayton, a historian of empire and of Kew at Imperial College London, argues that this endeavor was precipitated by the, unprofit the quote, unprofitability, unquote, of the West Indian slave economy. And in this way, banks sought to bolster this important source of revenue. Elsewhere, he was an early exponent 
of what would later become known as the white man's burden. The notion that the subjugation of people worldwide was justified by the inherent virtue of Western civilization. Of the Bengalis, he said, quote, the latest posterity will wonder how their ancestors were able to exist without them and revere the names of their British conquerors to whom they will be indebted for the abolition of famine. It is a cruel irony that famine would be, in fact, one of the, de the defining features of British rule in India. I would next like to turn to three other founding figures in the history of Botanic Gardens. William Hooker is credited with taking the gardens at Kew from a royal pleasure ground to a public institution. At the heart of this transition was the promise that Kew could orchestrate a global network of botanic gardens in service to the empire, based on the recommend recommendations of report by John Lindley, published in 1840. His son, Joseph, Joseph famous, famously spent his younger days enjoying the botanical riches to be discovered in the colonies and went on to direct this customs house of British imperialism. Charles Darwin is perhaps most emblematic of the problem, problematic relationship that institutions of classification have with colonization. He is remembered pri primarily as a great naturalist, but his theory of evolution by natural selection was co-opted to justify white supremacy. To quote Darwin himself, writing The Descent of Man, at some future period, not very distant as, me as measured but by, but by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. As the same, at the same time, the anthropomorphous apes will no doubt be exterminated. The break between man and his nearest allies will be wider, for it will intervene between man in a more civilized state, as we may hope, even than the Caucasian. And some ape as low as a baboon, instead of as now, between the Negro, Australian, and the gorilla. Here we see Darwin positing the necessity of genocide as a logical conclusion of his theory. It is crucial to point out that racism is categorically not a logical conclusion of Darwin's theory, nor was racism founded in this theory. The origins of our modern conception of race is fundamentally tied to the institution of slavery, offered as a justification for the immoral activities of otherwise God-fearing Christians. Furthermore, the very concept of race has been found to have no scientific basis. Categories such as mongoloid, negroid, and caucasoid are arbitrary categories invented to legitimate the colonization and enslavement of others. I am not attempting to equate Charles Darwin with the captains of British slave ships or plantation owners in the southern states of America. In his youth, Darwin wrote of the wretched conditions of slaves in his diaries from the, Be from the Beagle Voyage. And he was a, sta a staunch abolitionist in the tradition of his gra grandfather, Josiah Wedgwood, who mass produced this image of an African-American in chains appealing for his freedom on the basis of shared humanity. As I understand it, Darwin lost the ideological vigor of his youth in face of the overwhelming spirit of the age to proclaim the white man's rule as the necessary conclusion of the supremacy of the white race. This racial theory found its most vehement articulation in the United States of America, where the economy was much more closely bound to the institution of slavery and the appropriation of indigenous land. To an African American and Native Americans alike, land is the scene of a crime. As such, the weight of past traumas lie heavy on spaces such as Bartram's Garden. 
founded by a colonist on land once inhabited by indigenous tribes. Christopher Bolden Newsom of Sankofa Community Farm at Bartram's Gardens argues that it, that it is for reasons such as this that people of color find it difficult to relate to institutions such as a botanic garden. Now some may argue that this is all in the past and there is no use in dragging these unpleasant histories into the light. In the words of Christopher from Sankofa Community Farm, quote, the thing about black folks and brown folks is that that whole argument, oh, that was 200 years ago, doesn't quite work for us because our memories are long, because we are still enduring the living effects of a lot of colonizers and settlers' decisions. So I think the first thing that spaces like this, if they want to redeem themselves, and that's what needs to happen, the word redemption, what does it mean to redeem? It means to sort of give a new value to, to make a new in terms, to give it a fresh value, to give it a purpose and a new meaning. And so I think what's going to be important to look at the actual history of what, is going, of, of what it is that we are doing and to be able to discuss that in some way. To quote Franz Fanon, psychologist and foundational post-colonial thinker, decolonization never goes unnoticed, for it influences individuals and modifies them fundamentally. It transforms spectators crushed with their inessentiality into privileged actors with the grandiose glare of history's floodlights upon them. The presence of Sankofa Community Farm on site at Bartram's Garden is one path to the kind of redemption that Christopher alluded to. The name Sankofa is derived from an Asante Adrinka phrase that is roughly translated to mean, there is no shame in going back for what you left behind. This phrase is foundational to the sense of self for many African Americans because it recalls the fact that many of them had their culture and identity annihilated during the process of enslavement. The community farm at Barchin's Garden is a space of healing. It is strongly linked to the ancestral spirituality of African Americans, and they practice a natural agriculture that promotes a holistic relationship between humanity and the natural world around them. In essence, what it does is to allow African Americans to envision themselves not as inessential victims, but as integral stewards, recalling their proud history of sensitive stewardship of the land. Other institutions in the northeast of the United States are engaged with similar activities. This is Farm in the City, a Pennsylvania Horticultural Society initiative run in collaboration with members of Soil Generation, a black and brown led collection of farmers. Farm in the City is a space where African Americans can articulate what is broadly referred to as Afroecology. Afroecology is rooted in the knowledge that systems of domination of man and, in, and the environment are not separate, and that to tackle one, we need to tackle the other. Their focus is on providing access to sustainable food systems and the participation therein. It is a source of empowerment, and this space, situated in the heart of Philadelphia, allows African Americans to articulate that amid the architecture of European power. This is the Masonic Temple, and this is Philadelphia City Hall. Various other institutions are involved in similar activities. This photo is taken from a, a report written by the BGCI entitled Caring for Your Community, a Manual for Botanic Gardens. Pictured 
is a, an urban farming initiative operated in collaboration with the Chicago Botanic Garden and their community outreach program, the Windy City Harvest. Windy City Harvest aims to empower African Americans, particularly African Americans in impo impoverished communities. Actually, I should, I should say the Windy City Harvest program aims to empower those who are economically disadvantaged, but there is a close correlation between dis economic disadvantage and African American um, and the African American experience. Other organizations also involved in this kind of work are Brooklyn Botanic Garden and New York Botanic Garden. My trip was conceived as part of a, pro of a research project for a dissertation entitled How Can Botanic Gardens Support Networks of Community Gardening? What I'm presenting tonight is the ideolog ideological basis for the motivations for that project. But to summarize the findings, horticultural institutions provide horticultural support in the, in the form of consultation and assistance, as well as training. They provide networking opportunities, facilitating community uh, connection between community gardens and providing a pl platform for communication. And they also promote resilience by allowing people often isolated working complicated um, and multifaceted roles as community gardening leaders to connect to each other and provide informal emotional support. To quote Dr. Bernadette Lynch, participation in such things is a small revolution in thinking for botanic gardens. It pictures bot botanic gardens not simply as repositories for biological diversity, but as integral parts of the community promoting sustainability in a holistic way. I believe we can see the, the logical conclusion of this small revolution in thinking in the last organization that I visited on my trip. The Westwood Lawn Botanic Garden and Village Farm seeks to create a system of indigenous land stewards by offering paid employment, training, and support to assist in the maintenance of green infrastructure in the neighborhood. There is a database of street trees in the neighborhood to inform ongoing tree management strategies. And the Westwood Lawn Botanic Garden and Village Farm hosts tours, lessons, and a variety of outdoor programs in publicly accessible garden plots distributed throughout the city. For me, what was most striking is that the botanic garden and the community have no boundary between them. Instead, the botanic garden is a framework through which their members can gain a deeper connection to the green space in their neighborhoods. Ultimately, the Westwood Lawn Botanic Garden and Village Farm challenges the duality of humanity and nature, where the needs of one can only be served by impinging on the needs of the other. Instead, it is constructing a flourish, flourishing community that emerges from an ecologically diverse and resilient environment. This captures the essence of that small revolution in thinking which so, in botanic gardens, which so often work to conserve pockets of nature from the ravages of economic ex exploitation. We are instead invited to imagine the botanic garden as an integrated feature of a sustainable socio-ecological system where the influence of humanity serves to increase the environment's diversity and resilience rather than from detracting from it. For those interested in pursuing this topic further, I have some suggestions for further reading. The quote I referenced and referred to earlier is from this report here, How Can Botanic Gardens Grow Their Social Role? It's a fascinating documentary that goes in depth into how the, the role of a botanic garden can be reframed. This book here, uh, written, published by Yale, Yale University Press, is an in-depth and, and sober analysis of the role of botanic gardens in the Imperial Project. 
Finally, this book, The Brother Gardeners by Andrea Wolfe, is a lighter introduction to the topic, but does faithfully reproduce some of the uh, cultural assumptions guiding the, the project of colonization. I have my th funders to thank, the RHS Folk Trust, the Q Guild, and the Bentham and Moxon Trust. And I am entirely indebted to these contributors whose contributions form the foundation for the dissertation that I was, current, I was able to produce on the back of. Um, finally, I would like to thank you for listening to my presentation and I would invite any questions. Luke. Yeah, um, I should say, say that the modern botanic garden is unrecognizable from the institutions that I described in the first section of the talk. And Hugh is currently working to promote community gardening on site with dedicated space down by the Lion Gate. The, it's a fledgling project and um, it seems to be going in an interesting direction, providing a, a space for, for, for um, workshops and such. Um, there are many organizations working to promote uh, the viability of community, community gardening in the UK. Um, not all of them botanic gardens. Um, in London, perhaps the one institution that connects all botanic, uh, community gardens is Social Farms and Gardens, um, which, which serves a similar role by promoting resilience and connecting community gardening leaders um, to prevent them feeling isolated alongside giving practical uh, support in terms of um, uh, logistical and organizational management. Edinburgh Botanic Gardens, uh, are also participating in um, community gardening, although the dynamic is slightly different there. Um, in Edinburgh, barriers to participation are mostly oriented around class. Um, and they have found that whilst you can, you, can give, you, can, you can show people the door quite easily, but it takes a lot of emotional investment and trust building to Build people, build the confidence in people to, en to enable enable them to walk through that door. And um, a lot of the work that's currently going on is trying to work out how to build that relationship and build that trust. Uh, and I think um, Chris's words about looking into what our institutions are doing and the cultural associations that they imply that that's an integral part of that process. Amber. Um, so the question is, are there examples um, of gardens that weren't colonized? I should say the Westwood Lawn Botanic Garden and Village Farm is run by Blacks in Green, um, which is, uh, which is it's led by African Americans. So um, what, it, what it emerges out of is, the, is a recognition which is implicit in a lot of communities of color that... Um, Social disadvantage is intimately linked with environmental degradation. Um, and uh, this realization seems to come more naturally to people who, who are on, on the forefront or, or, or at, the, at the point of connection between the current ecological crisis and the, and, and the, the social ramifications. So a, a lot of African Americans face um, more exposure to pollution and they, they face um, less access to things like fresh vegetables and because of our, the alienation in, uh, from the point of production in, production in our food system. So 
it is in these communities that the the path forwards is being pioneered. So I, I hope that answers your question. Um, the Westwood Lawn Botanic Garden is an example, I think. 